Okay, welcome everyone uh, to this afternoon's session on forced marriage and FGM protection orders. Um, I'm Charlotte Proudman, I'm the barrister at Goldsmith Chambers and a junior research fellow at Queen's College in Cambridge, where I specialise in FGM law and policy in this jurisdiction. So, forced marriage. What is it? It is a marriage where one or both parties do not consent to the marriage. Uh, that can be either because they do not want to enter into the marriage or perhaps they don't have capacity to enter into the marriage because they lack consent. So typically the pressure or abuse by families or the wider community is applied uh, to force a marriage to take place. And it is defined within law as being to enter into a marriage without one's free and full consent. The person forcing the marriage can either be a party to the marriage or potentially could be a third person. Uh, so it may be, for example, that it may be a family member or a community member that is forcing them into marriage. And importantly, marriage can be interpreted as either a religious or a civil ceremony. It doesn't have to be simply a civil ceremony that is recognised in this jurisdiction. For example, there are religious ceremonies, for example, nikahs, um, which are not considered to be valid marriages, but nevertheless uh, are considered as such under the relevant legislation. So, forced marriage protection orders, they were introduced recently in 2007 and they were introduced into the Family Law Act. Uh, we refer to them as FGM protection orders. The law itself is the Forced Marriage Civil Protection Act 2007. And the purpose is largely to try and be preventative, so to prevent that marriage from taking place and prevent someone from being forced into the marriage. But even if the marriage has happened, then one can apply for a forced marriage protection order um, to assist that person uh, in either getting out of the marriage or being given assistance, or if they've been taken abroad and forced into marriage, then one may require assistance to repatriate them back to this jurisdiction. You can apply for a forced marriage protection order to do just that. So how does one decide when to apply for an FGMPO, a uh, forced marriage protection order, and what are the circumstances that the court will consider? Well, very similar to the FGM protection orders, in fact, it's, de it's defined the same, is that the court will consider all the circumstances, including the health, safety, and well-being of the person to be protected. And they'll consider the wishes and feelings of the person to be pre protected. But of course, that often depends upon the age and understanding. Um, so who can apply for a forced marriage protection order? There are three categories of people that can. So of course the individual, the victim or person to be protected. Uh, it could also be a child. A relevant third party as defined by the Lord Chancellor. And local authorities are also designated as relevant third parties. And anyone can apply with leave of the court. But first they have to make an application to show that they ought to be making this application and the court will consider whether to grant them that leave. Now, uh, forced marriage protection orders. Um, if that order is breached um, and there is no reasonable excuse for the breach of a forced marriage protection order, the court can impose a fine not exceeding level five on the standard scale, which is around, I'm told, £5,000, a term of imprisonment not exceeding six months. So they are fairly wide in nature in terms of breaches and in fact people have been imprisoned for forced marriage protection orders for breaching those orders. So uh, FGM, moving on to female genital mutilation or FGM as it's referred to. Uh, there are no reliable statistics to show the number of girls and women that have suffered the practice, but it's understood that over 130,000 women and girls are living with FGM and over 60,000 girls are at risk of the practice. It involves four types of FGM and that's set out by the World Health Organization. FGM can result in care proceedings and the first reported case involving care proceedings in FGM was Reed B&G, which was a former president's decision at Mumby, and that was a 2015 decision. Now, FGM is a criminal offence, as indeed is forced marriage. 
FGM, however, was criminalised in 1985 through specific criminal legislation. But despite that, there has only been one conviction for FGM, and that was not until 2019. The motivations of the practice similar to forced marriage can vary enormously uh, and there often is an overlap between FGM cases and families without immigration status due to the risk of FGM ordinarily being overseas and women and girls seeking asylum in this country to prevent them from being removed where they could be cut. So FGM protection orders, uh, they were introduced quite late after forced marriage protection orders and one of the purposes of these orders was to look at why is the criminal law not working and how can civil law or family law better accommodate FGM in providing legal redress for victims, uh, survivors of FGM. So the Bar of Human Rights Committee recommended the introduction of FGM protection orders which were modelled specifically on forced marriage protection orders and so you'll see that the law is effectively almost the same when looking at the legal provisions in both acts. So they were introduced in 2015 under the Serious Crime Act 2015 which amended the FGM Act 2003 and incorporated Schedule 2. Um, over 400 orders have been made since the introduction in 2015 to 2019, which is a considerable number, considering supposedly only a minority of the population are at risk of FGM. And of course, there hasn't been a huge amount of awareness that these orders can indeed be applied for. They're ordinarily not punitive in nature unless the orders are breached, which is very similar to forced marriage protection orders. And the intention is to protect girls and women at risk of FGM rather than waiting until girls or women have been cut and then applying for the order. And support can be received from the FGM unit in the Home Office and the National FGM Centre through Bernardo's for professionals that are working on FGM cases and may need some guidance either from the Home Office or from social workers at the National FGM Centre. So this is an example of uh, part of FGM protection orders within Schedule 2, which helpfully just sets out um, what the guiding threshold is when making this application. So again, very similar to forced marriage protection orders in that the court will have regard to all the circumstances, including the need to secure the health, safety and well-being of the girl to be protected when deciding whether to make that order. And an FGM protection order will contain such prohibitions, restrictions, requirements or other terms that are necessary to keep that person safe. And importantly, FGM protection orders and forced marriage protection orders do not just relate to conduct outside of England and Wales, they relate to conduct within this jurisdiction. Um, and so you have sort of a, a, a very broad discretion when these orders are made and that the court can attempt to curtail behaviour uh, abroad and beyond. And respondents can be a wide variety of different individuals uh, to prevent this type of behaviour from happening. As I've stated, there's no threshold to apply for FGM protection orders. Uh, so FGM protection orders um, can often be up to a very low threshold. So even if there's really a very low risk of FGM, perhaps you haven't been able to identify um, further dynamics within the family because the family may not be cooperative, but it's understood, for instance, that the mother may have been cut. And we know that a mother having been cut is one of the single biggest indicators that their daughter could be cut. That on its own, um, in a, perhaps also considering a summer holiday to a high prevalence country, one may consider as sufficient to apply for an FGM protection order and for that order to be granted. Uh, a cautious approach is taken when the protective person does not have immigration status. So whilst it's right that FGM protection orders and forced marriage protection orders can curtail conduct abroad outside of this jurisdiction, um, one has to consider very carefully what to do when you're attempting to subject a person to such an order who doesn't have British immigration status. The concern being that there are attempts at the family court to make decisions that could potentially bind the Home Secretary and curtail their immigration powers. And in a decision by Mr Justice Newton and the President, it's made very clear in uh, last year and also this year 
um, that the family court does not have power to curtail um, the um, family court's exercise, um, the, the immigration court, sorry, exercise of their decision making and the Home Secretary's exercise of their powers. Um, in fact, interestingly, in Newton's decision in Suffolk County Council in RD, which was this year, in fact, Newton looked at the decisions that had been made by the uh, Home Office and also by the immigration courts in which they had found that the mother was not credible and that the child was at a very low risk of FGM. And Mr. Justice Newton conducted his own fact find hearing instructing experts including a psychiatrist and including country experts and Mr Justice Newton went above and beyond the decisions that were made by the immigration jurisdiction and said actually I consider there's a very high risk of FGM and I consider that this mother is credible and so you can see that both jurisdictions um, can often make very different decisions because uh, the legal principles in those different jurisdictions again are divergent um, I appeared in this case on behalf of the mother and a court of appeal decision um, I have just read and is due to be released shortly and that concerns whether the immigration decision and the Home Office decision is the starting point when any family court decides whether to make an FGM protection order. As I say, that decision is awaited. I've seen it. It appears unlikely that uh, the court of appeal take that approach. Um, the travel ban. Uh, so often many cases will concern travel bans or travel restrictions where there is a risk of a British citizen, a girl, being taken from this country um, potentially to a high prevalence country. In the case of Rex, this concerned a girl um, who was going to be taken by her mother to Egypt to meet her father. Of course, Egypt being a very high prevalence country of over 90% women and girls who have been cut. And in that case, Mr. Justice Cobb set out the macro and micro risk factors that ought to be considered when deciding whether to make an FGM protection order. And I appeared on behalf of the mother in the case of REX, and it sets out quite lengthy the types of considerations uh, that the court will look into. Um, so I'm going to leave it there. Um, does anyone have any questions? We very much welcome questions and we'll try our best to answer those um, now. I can see. We have the wonderful Sharon um, who is helping to moderate. So perhaps Sharon could also help uh, in reading out any questions that we have. Sure. So first question that's come in um, is a question about uh, well, I'll just read the question straight out. Um, the question is, in a situation where one needs to make an application to court as a concerned third party, would waiting to first obtain the leave of court to do so defeat the urgency of the application? Oh, it's, it's an excellent question. I can see from an academic perspective how one might fear that that is the case, but in practice, no, it's not. Uh, so you make one application for leave, uh, so for permission, uh, for leave to make that application and you also at the same time make an application for an FGM protection order or a forced marriage protection order. So there are two applications that are submitted to the court and then the court will decide on looking at those applications where the leave is granted and if so you've met the first hurdle and then the court will go on to consider whether to make the application. So it's dealt with often very swiftly uh, without any delays. It's dealt with ordinarily at one hearing um, and then Charlotte, what are your um, views on the relationship or the, um, the differences between trying to obtain protection through an FGMPO as against a prohibited steps order, for example, where they're seeking a ban on travel? Uh, yes, so if the risk is FGM, then it's important that an FGM protection order is applied for. A prohibited steps order simply won't be sufficient because it won't explain to the court or any judge that's looking at the case again in the future uh, what the risk factors might be. And with an FGM protection order, it can sometimes involve getting the Home Office to disclose papers. It could involve getting the Foreign and Commonwealth Office or the Home Office involved. Um, it, particularly if it concerns the travel of minors overseas when looking at a travel ban. A prohibited steps order often isn't overarching and overreaching in the, in the very same way 
that an FGM protection order is and of course the threshold or the legal principles for making those applications are often very different as well. An FGM protection order, the risk needs only to be low to make that application in my experience and there's no, um, there's certainly no definition in the current legislation to say what that threshold is or in case law. That looks like all of the questions that have come in uh, for today. Uh, so I don't know if there's any other points, Charlotte, that you wanted to touch on before bringing everything to a close. I would just stress upon parties, but particularly local authorities, um, to make applications for FGM protection orders or forced, forced marriage protection orders if you consider that there is a risk of a girl or woman being subjected to this behaviour, indeed a man, if it's forced marriage in particular. Um, because I think often there can, uh, certain cases that I see, there can be quite a delay in making that application due to concerns that, well, it's difficult to evidence the risk or they're concerned that the court may criticise them for making that application. But in fact, I often see, uh, I, I certainly have never seen anyone being criticised making that application. And I usually see cases where the courts have said, you should have brought this application a lot earlier than you have. You mustn't delay. Uh, these are urgent applications and I'll stress upon people that it's very rare for anyone, for example, to be subject to a cost order. Um, so there are concerns that you're not sure whether to make the application because you may think that uh, you could be subject to costs. That's, that's simply uh, unlikely to happen. Um, there has been a few more questions coming in. If we've got some time, I don't know whether you'd be happy to answer a couple of them. Yes, of course. Um, one is um, a question about evidence and really how do you best evidence the risk at where you say that there is one? Uh, yes, so if, if obviously the case is that there is a risk of FGM, it's important that the party making that application sets out where that risk comes from in a witness statement. Usually it will involve, for example, high prevalence country, the mother having been cut perhaps a holiday to another country where FGM is prevalent. Um, perhaps it may involve um, behavior uh, within the family, such as not discussing uh, where the family holiday is taking place, not wanting to disclose information about that. It may involve other family members who have been cut or there are some concerns of that nature. It's important to set that out in a statement. It's unlikely you'll have exhibits to identify concretely that there is a risk of FGM. It's very rare that you get that type of information. But in fact, setting it out into a statement and of course if the court accepts that you're credible, ordinarily they'll take that certainly at first um, at, at face value, certainly for the first hearing. Um, there's no reason um, why you cannot make an application simply with a witness statement. I've seen other cases where the risk of FGM has been identified through a letter or through an email. Uh, the court often approached cases of that nature with a great deal of scepticism as it can look as though one is trying to bolster the application or bolster the risk of FGM posed um, by attaching so-called evidence to show that there is a cogent risk of FGM. Um, that's great. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, that looks like all of the questions on this topic for today. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening and thank you, Sharon, for moderating and hosting the panel. Um, and it has been a real pleasure to speak with you all this evening. If you have any more questions that we haven't been able to get through, then don't hesitate to send my family clock an email, Alex Nunn, you can see his email uh, under the contact details slide. So thank you again.